And what, what is life like for the average person there? Not someone who's in part of the political elites or anything like that, just the everyday person, these 25 million people who yeah. are all there. I mean, I would imagine, and I think I've heard you say this, that you've said before that, you know, if you're truly oppressed, you don't know that you're oppressed. Or if you're truly isolated, then you don't know that you're isolated. So at least on a kind of surface level, Mm. are people for the most part happy is a weird word. Are they, are they sort of happy because they don't know any better and they think that that's all life has to offer? Or is there a feeling of discontent, discontentment, which of course people are not going to publicly speak about and so on because you know, they're, they're so tyrannized and they have to suppress it. But would, would you say that the average person there is, does sense this oppression and some form of resentment? Or do you think that they're just kind of happy and, and placid? And I, again, I know you can't mind read, but I'm just trying to really get a grasp of what it must be like for someone to mm. grow up and live in such a place. So it's a like a, a lot of people are asking like you know what's if you like to live in North Korea and I used to think like maybe my English is not good enough I cannot describe <laughs> this to people and in a way it's indescribable because imagine right now we're sitting here trying to imagine life on Mars mm -hmm. we can't because we don't know the norms there we don't even know what they have you know. And it's like that, like for North Koreans, they are isolated and oppressed to the point. They don't even have a vocabulary to uh, describe their situation. The regime removed the words like freedom, love, liberty, and oppression. Because, and even stress, they say like, you know, how can you be stressed living in a socialist paradise? Mm -hmm. So we cannot use that word. They even banned the word famine during the greatest famine where millions of people were dying that's when i was a toddler in the 90s it's one of the worst human uh famines that we've ever seen in the modern history that happened in north Korea in the 90s people was were not allowed to use the word famine and hunger so you have you don't even have the vocabulary to describe your situation is that am i am i correct in saying that you had to use the term is it like the great march or something like that yeah, the arduous march. Yes, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, they, they don't allow us to say it's a great famine. Yeah. Can you explain yeah. that a little bit? So the arduous march is a supposedly, according to the propaganda, where Kim Il-sung took this very arduous march during the Revolutionary War when he was trying to find an independence for Korea from Japanese imperialism at the time, in the 90s and 1920s. And he made up this story where how that revolutionary march led to the victory. So as North Koreans in the 90s, 1990s to do the same and do not describe the situation as a famine or hunger. It's the arduous march. We are all revolutionaries. We are fighting for this victory at the end. We are going to get the socialist paradise if we persevere enough. If we work hard one more day, we are going to get that a utopia that we were promised because apparently socialism needs to eventually bring that utopia to everybody, right? That's mm -hmm. what they're guaranteeing. And North Korea, nobody who was alive lived 80 years in a day of utopia. So Kim Il-sung always had a promise in the future, this year, if we work hard, if we sacrifice more, then that year we are going to achieve that utopia, we're going to enter that utopia. And that was another propaganda to tell the Korean people to suffer more. Wow. I've also heard that um, Kim Jong-il, I've heard that he, in his first game of golf that he scored, was it 11 holes in one? I've heard that he um, invented the burrito in yeah. 1992 and some other interesting fables as well. Yeah, some McDonald's. Too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, he invented did, McDonald's? Yeah, they invented okay. everything. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. So tell me what it was like when you... So once you got out of North Korea, you first went to China, that's right? Mm -hmm. And then, am I right in saying you spent time as well in South Korea and Mongolia before you got to the U.S.? Yeah, so I was in China, uh, sold as a slave, and 
I was separated from my mom. Uh, two years, I found her back. Long story short, I met Christian missionaries from South Korea that they were rescuing North Koreans to safety. Mm. And they told us if we want to escape from China, we have to walk across the frozen Gobi Desert into Mongolia from China. Because North Koreans are fugitives. We don't have papers or passports. Uh, only thing we could do was physically walking across the desert. So when I was 15 years old, uh, we did cross the frozen river, uh, the desert into Mongolia. And luckily from there, we were able to go to South Korea and become a refugee. And I lived in South Korea for five years before I came to the U.S. I hear that. What was it like being in South Korea? It's, you know, time traveling. <laughs> it's a landing on a different planet. It, it was, I mean, I it was like a big gigantic baby, you know, like learning how to use a toilet, learning, seeing this nice soft toilet paper for the first time in my life and seeing the phone, you know, seeing internet. I mean, a flat screen TV, I mean, everything was new and it was just very overwhelming, exciting. But I still remember like it was very hard because after going to North Korea, I entered South Korea these uh, officials in South Korea, the first thing they teach us that Americans are not bastards. <laughs> they are very great country, the democracy. And you guys been lied that what you believed were like dictatorship. And then they said, everything that you believed was a lie. And I was thinking, so if I, everything I believed was a lie, how do I know what you're telling me is not a lie? Mm -hmm. You'd literally have this issue you trust afterwards. So it took a while for me to really understood like what happened. And how did that, how did that make you feel? I mean, knowing that these first third, first 13 years of your life, which at the time is you mm -hmm. know, pretty much your entire life. Mm -hmm. how, how did that, how did your brain even sort of fathom with this concept of just being living and raised in a, in one big lie? In the beginning, you deny, you mm. know, a lot of the passion I deny. Like by then, like I was even in China two years. So in China, I still didn't have any education. So I believed all the North Korean propaganda, even till China, I believed that my dear leader couldn't read my mind, you know, that mm. kind of brainwashing. But that was like, I was even 15 years old, but like some like my mother and her friends in their forties, they would just refuse to believe that Korean War began by Kim Il Sung. They still believe like Americans came and invaded North Korea, and they um, they believe that Kim Il Sung was not a dictator. He was a very moral guy working for the people tirelessly. He was a great great leader. The problem was the people working for him was corrupt officials. Mm -hmm. So this is a, the North Korean theory. They need to somehow make a peace with their reality. So there are a lot of them eventually come to this realization, okay, how can, is it possible that our dear leader can be at fault? He's a god. So he's great, but the people who worked for him wasn't telling him the truth and did the right thing. So they blamed the officials and another dictator. And then maybe another five years passed in South Korea, then you do come to realization slowly. Maybe that was maybe not a great guy. He maybe cannot like go to, Maybe he goes to the bathroom, you know, <laughs> begins from there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 